of course jesus inherited that inherent respect for life in the womb yeah. uh, love of children uh recognition that procreation was you know we were seeing god's work god's handiwork in every child in the womb so yeah i think to that extent there was no need for him to to sort of say well oh by the way abortion is not what god wants you to be doing or um you know to, to, to kind of make that explicit because it was so as i say it was so saturated within the kind of worldview and Welcome back to About Abortion. I'm Beth Davey and I'm joined once again by Tim Lewis. Tim, I hope you had a good weekend. Yes, uh, well, thanks, Beth. We're just back from holiday, actually, a week or so. So uh, feeling, uh, yeah, good. Nice break, but good to be back. Good, good. So we are going to be doing a continuation on um, the topic that we were doing last time. So last time we were looking at, does the Old Testament support abortion? And we thought that it would be really good to kind of continue that conversation on into the New Testament. So as a quick kind of previously on about abortion, as it might be, um, just so that listeners are up to speed on where the conversation is. If you haven't listened, do do go back and listen to those um, that that episode, we do recommend that that would be a good place to start before this one. But for those of you who did, um, we covered three important scriptures in the Old Testament that can often be used by people to maybe try and advocate for abortion from scripture. So we looked at um, the special creation of Adam in Genesis 2, where God breathes life into Adam, briefly touched on um Exodus 21 in the case law studies of um, how valuable is the life of an unborn child in the Mosaic law. And then we looked at another obscure passage from Numbers chapter five, where a woman suspected of adultery takes this curious um, curse liquid um, to determine whether or not she has in fact been unfaithful to her husband. Um, and the bottom line really was that you can't use these texts as pretexts uh, for abortion, uh, really, we felt that they were being taken out of context. And when you read back into the context of what's going on, you get a whole new understanding of what these texts really mean. But Tim, maybe could you just give us kind of a bottom line of, of what the Old Testament points to in regards to children in the womb um, and those times where they, they are described as being taken from the womb? Absolutely, Beth, thanks. The one text we didn't manage to touch on was Hosea 9.14, which people have also claimed somehow shows God endorsing abortions, which mm -hmm. is uh, give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. And precisely because children pregnancy are such a blessing, the prophet wishes uh, these things upon faithless Israel here. And that expression effectively reverses a blessing in Genesis 49.25, which mentions blessings of the breast and womb, meaning fertility in children. Hosea is essentially saying, I think, that if such is the reward for obedience, then Israel has deserved the opposite. And in pretty stark language, he wishes God's curse upon them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like similar moments in the Psalms, we might think of uh, dashing little ones against rocks, for instance. We need to be very careful how we interpret such petitions. And critically, we must remember it's the prophet's interjection born out of a deep frustration and grief with a stubborn people rather than any kind of statement of divine intent. This is not presented as God speaking. Yes, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over life and death, but he is consistently presented as the one who gives life and fashions and himself fashions every child in the womb. So in terms of the bottom line, Beth, the only time children are presented as being deliberately removed from the womb in the Old Testament involves uh, a war crime, really this abhorrent act of ripping open pregnant women's uh, stomachs uh, an act that of course kills both mother and child and is severely reprimanded in scripture so if you look at 2 kings 8 12 2 kings 15 16 amos 1 13 you'll see this practice uh, and it's very stark uh, condemnation and in amos in fact the people who did this are told by the prophet that they will be punished by god for precisely this crime so no the old testament does not in any way shape or form uh, permit or encourage or endorse abortion. 
Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, now, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, sometimes people can claim that maybe regulations and practices in the Old Testament um, they don't continue into the New Testament. There's maybe sometimes in the mind of some Christians this break between the Old and New Testament, um, unless it's expressly stated in the new testament things don't continue so if jesus didn't say abortion was wrong then maybe we can assume license in this area um or other people might say look you have to look at the trajectory that scripture sets so um some issues that are maybe restricted in the old testament they're relaxed into the new and so and so we've got more license in regards to today tim is this what happens with abortion? So between the Old and the New Testament, do we see a relaxation on abortion laws? Um, do we say because Jesus didn't speak specifically that that means we've got license in this area? What What would you say to something like that? Well, I think first off the bat, I think you'd have to say you need pretty strong a, a pretty strong countertext to to say that suddenly God has endorsed killing one's child in the womb. It's, it's quite a major step, isn't it? I think the key thing to say about the New Testament, Beth, is that there's two kind of worldviews that, that inform the New Testament, really. One is the Jewish background, which we'll come to in a moment, which, of course, is essentially shaped by the Old Testament or mm. largely shaped by the Old Testament. And then there's the Greco-Roman world of the Mediterranean first century. And within the Gospels, we see the harsh realities of life uh, in that Roman-occupied Palestine. So ever-present heavy taxation, the bureaucracy of uh, a census, or the horrific practice of crucifixion. You know, the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, is maintained through very violent brutality. And the Greeks, the Romans, do not share the Jewish reverence for life, including life in the womb. So several hundred years before uh, Christ, the two kind of preeminent Greek philosophers, uh, Plato and Aristotle, they both permit abortion. They argue for its use in terms of limiting family size, population growth, and actually for Plato when the mother was over a certain age. So mm -hmm. the individual, certainly the unborn child, is of lesser value compared to the requirements of the state. We see that mindset today, I think. Now, there were various theories about when the soul entered the child in the womb, but the unborn child is consistently not viewed as a person or a citizen. And of course, even once they're born, uh, infants, newborn infants were routinely killed. Um, and in fact, uh, exposure, which just means leaving in, uh, infants exposed to die or even sometimes uh, killing them themselves. But but exposure was actually the more usual means of, of their destruction compared to abortion. To put it bluntly, it was easier to do and there was much less risk to the mother mm -hmm. in trying to kill the child when he or she was within the womb. So. And exposure for, at birth is very common for female babies, sadly, in, in the Greco-Roman age, and disabled infants were almost always exposed at birth. The one caveat to that is the Hippocratic Oath, which contains a promise um, that, that people would take not to permit uh, a non-therapeutic abortion, so any abortion performed without the express intent of saving the mother's life. Uh, can I just ask, Tim... Sorry, yeah. is that the same Hippocratic Oath that is still taken today? Because um, I know that they Absolutely. doctors still do take that oath, don't they? Absolutely. I mean, very influential in the history of kind of uh, Western thought as well as mm. medicine. Yeah, the, the, uh, the general idea is that you preserve life at all costs. Yeah. And sadly, and, and obviously for hypocrisies, that included the life of the child in the womb. Sadly, that hasn't continued into, into medicine today in many mm. parts of the Western world, including... Britain, but and, and and even in the Greek and Roman world, outside of that medical world, attitudes are very permissive. And we see that also in Roman law. Uh, in Roman law, the father possesses the patria potestas, which just means the power of a father in Latin over his offspring. So essentially, he decides at birth whether the newborn baby should live or die. Just imagine that. And as we've said, on often on grounds of, of disability or even gender, the child would be killed. And it was within his rights to do that. Um, and in terms of abortion, we actually have a case involving the Emperor Domitian. So Domitian lived 51 AD to 96 AD. And it's believed, to put this in context of folks, that John wrote Revelation right at the end of Domitian's reign. So when Christians were beginning to be persecuted. And Domitian orders his niece, whom he's made pregnant, to have an abortion. And she does, and she dies as well as her child. So very, uh, very, very common, despite uh, Hippocrates' concerns, 
And actually, even in this period, medical textbooks become available detailing how abortions could be performed. Mm. There is some later pushback, uh, later Roman ethicists, people like Cicero, Ovid, Seneca, more, more critical. But their concerns, if anything, Beth, just suggest the scale of the issue uh, here. Um, so again, Roman law, like Greek law, the, the unborn child is not viewed as fully human. When um, when there is a pushback against abortion, it's primarily to kind of, they're worried about re- uh, population decline and they want to reverse that. But I think why that's helpful is it gives us a sense of the culture, the very pro-abortion culture into which the gospel takes root and begins to transform society. And Christianity emerges from Judaism and these very different Jewish beliefs about children. Mm. So Jewish writers like Philo, like Josephus, they stress the fact that Jews love children. They would neither kill their offspring in the womb nor expose them after birth. And in one of Josephus's works, um, he basically says that abortion is morally equivalent to infanticide to doing just that. You know, Whether you kill a child before he or she is born or after, it, it really makes no difference. It's murder. So the Jewish position emphasizes the goodness of God's uh, creation, the goodness of human procreation, actually, and God's sovereignty in forming the unborn child, these kind of key themes in the Old Testament. And the early Christians just kind of pick up with that and run with it. And so what you get is early Christian ethical uh, treaties like the Didache, um, which is perhaps end of the first century, so very soon after the New Testament, very uncompromising on the immorality of abortion. The difference, of course, between Christians and Jews is that you have the added factor that Jesus himself, um, the word made flesh, has become an unborn child Mm. from conception. So this leads to an even greater reverence of life towards the life of the unborn child. And in the first centuries, Christians were known for people uh, who took care of the vulnerable, the weak, uh, including rescuing uh, children that had been exposed, etc. So I just think it's important to have that kind of cultural, historical background um, for the New Testament, and, and, and to see Jesus really as he is, as an inheritor of a Jewish scriptural worldview which deeply valued, deeply loved children, including children in the womb. Yeah, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but what, didn't uh, the historian Tacitus say that it was morally repugnant that the Jewish people didn't kill their children? Um, I, I believe he said that. So in that culture, it was thought of that um, if you didn't, if you weren't pro-abortion that that was a bad thing that was a morally negative thing kind of very similar today yeah i mean i think certainly that's i'm sure that's true certainly tacitus um flags up the fact that the jews a they have lots of children and b they don't kill children at birth and then he says well that's kind of how their population grows so so yeah and i'm sure he he sort of looked on that uh or certainly looked on the attitude that would never allow abortion a little bit dimly um yeah so you can see a parallel certainly to today's culture that's a mm-hmm. good point well yeah so thank thanks for that kind of overall background so as we go into these uh, the new testament some maybe some texts it's really helpful to understand the incredibly pro-abortion culture that they were they were speaking into um, and i think it's again important to establish the role of children in the new testament Uh, before we go into maybe abortion. So Dave and I have looked at the importance of Jesus himself as a vulnerable child. We looked at that at Christmas, but maybe just to recap, um, right from the offset of the gospels, we see that value of the infant Jesus, both inside the womb and outside of the womb. And really the miracle, as you said, of the incarnation is that humanity, flesh, the body, um, it is important in um, Christianity that's so important that God actually became a human being in flesh, as you said, from conception. So if we were to look at um, continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think the prime example is the parallel that Matthew draws between Moses and Jesus just in um, the, the birth narrative there in Matthew. Uh, again, we've spoken about this in the past the killing of the baby boys uh, in the account of the life of Moses and how God rewarded the midwives who refused to do that. Um, And then the same way Jesus's early life is threatened by uh, the hand of the ruler and God protects both Moses and Jesus. So in both of those, we see the same value is placed on the life of the children at the um as the culture around is seeking to kill so 
it seems like there is perfect continuity there between the Old and New Testament. Um, again, more specifically in Matthew, the vulnerability is Jesus is referred to the child in, in that narrative. Uh, he is mentioned by name Jesus, but then Herod is called Herod and he's referred to the child, which just brings up those ideas um, of vulnerability, dependence, both on his parents and on God. Um, and just how fragile his life really was in in those times. Uh, and I think that that status of children as being vulnerable and dependent continues. You just think of um the disciples who are who are being frustrated as people keep trying to bring children in and you may you know think of a, a Sunday after church when you're trying to have a conversation, you're trying to pray with someone, and kids keep running in and interrupting and trying to get your attention. And the disciples are frustrated by this, but Jesus, on the other hand, isn't frustrated with the interruption of children. And he he says, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. It's to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And quite rightly, I think we think this means that we need to be innocent like children, have the simple faith of children. But I also think it's it's about that vulnerability and dependence on God that, that the children have. They're completely dependent on their parents. As you said, um, the first century world, they would have been marginalized. Uh, they, they would have no status. And, and we kind of need to become like these low status, give up our self-reliance um, and become like children. Um, again, Matthew 21, Pharisees are annoyed as, as the children are shouting praises of Jesus in the temple. Um, and I think it's quite clear here that the religious leaders of the day are blinded to the reality of who Jesus is. But that revelation is given to the, the children, those of lowly status. And Jesus says that they'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. They know who Jesus is as the chosen one. So um, the New Testament gives quite high value just to the status um, and dignity and value of children in contrast to what they would have held in the cultural day, as Tim, you laid out for us. Um, and, and equally, the New Testament doesn't linguistically make a distinction between inside the womb and outside the womb. As we've mentioned before, the word brephos refers both to unborn child and a newborn baby or an infant. So um, Luke uses this, that uses this term in chapter one to refer to John the Baptist inside the womb and in Luke chapter two to refer to Jesus lying in the manger. There's, there's no difference. It's the same person both inside the womb and outside the womb. So in the Gospels, it's quite clear that there is an elevation, a privilege that comes from being a child, uh, which, yeah, just highlights that value and dignity with which God holds. And it, it doesn't discriminate whether they're, they've been born or whether they're unborn. God still highlights their dignity and value. So that's just an overview of the value of children in the New Testament. But Tim, are there any passages that could potentially deal with abortion before they've been born in the New Testament? Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Beth. That was great. And uh, there's something, isn't there, that powerful about the praise of children, the praise and worship of children. I think that that moment when Jesus comes into the temple and he's welcomed and, and he's praised and he's, his identity really is correctly identified by those little children. And they are little children at that point. I think it's so powerful. Um, your children, children before the age of, uh, before the age of bar mitzvah, so before they kind of take the weight of the law on their shoulders, uh, at least for the boys, they, they, they are recognizing who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was really helpful. And, and I think as you, there's there's lots of other parallels, there's lots of the kind of typological links and the, and the classic one, as you've said, is Moses and, and Jesus. You can also look at the way, for example, that Paul describes his calling and his vocation from the womb. It's almost word for word, the prophet jeremiah you know? yeah, so yeah. paul obviously understood that his his uh, life his call began at that early stage but yeah i mean in terms of so, so the the kind of the key thing to hold on to i think is that very pro uh pro child pro children kind of um ethos that really comes across it saturates 
of the New Testament, and particularly Jesus' teaching, particularly Jesus' interaction with children. You know, again, we mentioned this before, but the number of healings specifically that involve just children, I think is really, you know, why, 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 why is that mentioned? I think there's obviously children are on Jesus' heart a lot. Mm. But yeah, in terms of abortion, I mean, we've talked about the fact that the word, um, so some people obviously throw this kind of rejoinder out, well, you know, the Bible doesn't mention abortion. So, so can you really talk about it as, you know, and we've talked about the fact that the Bible doesn't mention the word Trinity and all the rest of it. But yeah, the word that abortion is not referred to in that way in the Old Testament and and isn't in the New Testament, except I think it is possible to see it perhaps a coded or an implicit reference to abortion in the mention of something called uh, pharmakeia, pharmakeia in the New Testament. So if you turn to Galatians 5, for example, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Paul gives one of these kind of vice lists, which appear in his letters at various points, sort of reeling off a whole series of things which Christians are no longer to do or be involved with because they've been born again, uh, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Um, so he begins, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Um, now, it's this word sorcery that interests us because that is the word pharmakeia in Greek. Um, so the ESV the translation I read translates it sorcery, the NIV witchcraft. And that's they're the kind of words that are used typically in most translations. But the seriousness of this transgression, whatever precise it is, is evident in the fact that this word is mentioned again, mainly in Revelation. So Revelation 9, uh, 21, Revelation 18, 23. And very closely related words, so words from kind of the same root, if you like, in Revelation 21.8 uh, and 22.15, all universally with negative judgments attached. So whatever mm -hmm. this is, and the New Testament does not look favorably on it. And the more kind of uh, the sharper folks may be watching have maybe click that the word pharmakeia is just the word we get the word pharmacy from in English. Now, Paul or revelation are not saying that christians cannot practice pharmacy or or you know there's something wrong with going to the pharmacy as understood in today's sense although when i was talking to dave about this he did say there's probably another conversation we could have one day about the ethical ambiguities around aspects of medical practice and mm, yeah. indeed drugs you know when for example does a contraceptive become actually abortifacient so causing abortion in its effects but but pu putting that aside for one moment accepting the kind of basic um that going to a pharmacy is not going to kind of damage your spiritual well-being the common meaning of the word pharmakeia the new testament links it with the occult magic and the dark arts hence those translations like witchcraft uh, niv or sorcery uh, esv and the overlap with the modern meaning of pharmacy really it lies in the preparation of drugs so so just as when you go to a pharmacy or chemist you know they are really dis dispensing medication and they'll have to prepare those and weigh them out and whatever else that's the kind of general theme that ties these ideas together so sorcery in the ancient world could include various potions prepared for evil intent not to not to make you better but to do some kind of harm to, to you or through some kind of sympathetic magic perhaps why all this is relevant, and there is a point to this, so bear with me. Why all this is relevant is that in the ancient world, this word pharmakeia could also indicate drugs prepared specifically to induce an abortion, so abortifacients. So, for example, um, the first, uh, so born in the first century, a medical writer and physician, a guy called Seranus of Ephesus, uh, he was responsible for a four volume treatise titled Gynecology. So, he was a Mm. not just a physician but someone who wrote on these matters and particularly on matters of gynecology he writes actually very disprovingly uh disapprovingly a bit like um hippocrates in that sense of abortifacients so he writes he's against drugs that cause abortion but the thing is beth he refers to them by this term okay so he's writing in greek and he calls them pharmakeia so the very same word we have in the new testament mm. wow. so in other words there's a kind of cultural and historical context parallel to the new testament in which pharmacare refers to drugs which cause abortion and the fact that this word pharmacare in revelation 9 21 22 is mentioned always alongside sexual immorality and murder actually adds weight to the theory that that's really perhaps what's going on in the background because 
the early Christians, so the church in the first and second century, consistently linked um, abortion to sexual immorality and also murder. Okay, And in the Didache, which I've mentioned, which was this probably late first century, possibly early second century uh, work, um, which really talks about how Christians should live. It kind of is based on the sort of two ways of, of Deuteronomy and the things that lead to life and the things that lead to death. Well, the prohibition on pharmakeia in chapter two of the Didache is connected again with sexual immorality and murder, just as like just as it is in Revelation, and it immediately precedes an explicit prohibition on abortion. So it may be that this is the kind of Didache making it clear, covering all its bases, if you like, that not only was the act of abortion wrong, it was viewed as murder, in fact, by the early Christians, by the uh, church in the first century, but that there was also a similar culpability for all those involved in the preparation or distribution of abortifacient mm. drugs. So the whole kind of industry or culture, if you like, that supported, that propped up, that made possible abortion is kind of condemned by the Didache in very uh, stark terms. It's, it's put on a par with murder. So... In the end, I don't think we can speak with absolute certainty on this particular point, but I think it's possible, very possible, perhaps, that abortion is implied through this condemnation of, of pharmakeia. So there may be a, a kind of coded reference there to abortion in the pages of the New Testament. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. When, when you were saying um, equal judgment or disapproval for those who prepare, uh, it makes me think of Romans 1 when it talks about not just those who practice it, but those who approve of it as well, um, also face the judgment of God. Um, and just thinking about, you know, uh, situations and, and uh, things that are going on today and uh, in the news, not just the people who um, have taken part in, in um, the DIY um, abortion pills, for example, but also those who have provided those means for people to break the law um, just hold just as much culpability, really, um, in what they've done, or should they should hold just as much culpability in what they've done. So that's really interesting. And it it's um, it's helpful to kind of have that cultural context again, because as you were saying that this seems to be going on outside of the New Testament, it, it may not be explicitly mentioned because they just assume that, you know, the readers will automatically go there in their minds. And so they don't need to spell it out because it's clear enough, um, which for us isn't very clear. But for the first century, readers could have just been written large, really, in the way that they've been grouped together. I think that's absolutely right. I think we're very much talking about cultural worldviews. And as I say, the kind of clash of two cultural worldviews between the sort of Greco-Roman pagan, if you like, and the Judeo-Christian on the other mm. side. It's a little bit parallel to the debate about sometimes people say, well, Jesus never explicitly condemns uh, homosexual practice, for example, in the Gospels, uh, even though it's very clear, clearly condemned elsewhere, actually, in the New Testament. But I think it's that whole thing. Well, Jesus was essentially an Orthodox first century Jew, of course, he would have seen uh, homosexuality as part of a whole list of prohibited sexual things. So they would have come on under one kind of a uh, blanket condemnation of, of, of sort of sexual immorality. Um, yeah, just as I think, the, as I say, the New Testament, which comes from a very much a kind of, it, 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 you know, salvations of the Jews, as Jesus says, it comes from the Jewish kind of milieu. Of course, Jesus inherited that inherent respect for life in the womb, yeah. uh, love of children. Uh, recognition that procreation was you know we were seeing god's work god's handiwork in every child in the womb so yeah i think to that extent there was no need for him to to sort of say well oh by the way abortion is not what god wants you to be doing or um you know to to, to kind of make that explicit because it was so as i say it was the, so saturated within the kind of worldview and yeah throughout it, the yeah it wasn't even a question so why would why no, would he exactly, address it exactly. if everyone just assumed it, it was wrong anyway yeah so exactly, right. i think it's really helpful to just kind of have that whole scriptural overview um both the old testament and the new testament so that we can see um not just these proof texts that have been taken out of context but the overall argument that scripture gives as to the life and value both of children and of um, the unborn child as well. So thank you very much, Tim, for um, helping me out in these past two um, episodes. But I think it would just be good to kind of finalize with where are these ideas coming from? 
because um you know if christians are trying to use scripture to, ju to justify why are they why are they trying to use scripture for um for pro-abortion uh justification and i think it comes down to the undermining of the authority um of god's word and god himself and maybe replacing it with autonomy and self-rule which really since the enlightenment that freedom of of self-rule and self-determination has been um the primary order of the day i think um going back to galatians 5 as you were talking when when paul lists uh, those vices as well as the fruits of the spirit in contrast what the life of the christian should look like he says um for you brother have been called to liberty only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another and i think this is really the key that the freedom that we have in christ isn't liberty to sin it's not freedom to do whatever we want because we have the grace of god covering us but it's freedom to follow christ uh, and and in contrast to these arguments as it would have been in those days so it is today it's countercultural that the christian life is a life of self-sacrifice for the love of other it's not self-assertion at the expense of the other and that just went right in the face of what they were um living in in the roman culture where where the father got to determine uh whether a child's life was worth living or not um so it is today we get to choose whether a child's life is worth living or not but as a christian we should be taking up our cross following jesus it's not about whether uh, we want to do it or not, but about what's what's for the love of God and the love of neighbor. Um, Tim, I don't know if you've got any final comments you wanted to make on that. Yeah, no, I think you've put it really well, Beth. I think any concept of freedom uh, that somehow encompasses taking a vulnerable human life is not is not worth the paper it's written on. It certainly cannot be. Uh, drawn from the pages of, of scripture either old or new testament so so no i think to kind of sum up both these episodes if you like there's mm. there's no grounds for uh supporting abortion from the pages of scripture in both the old and the new testaments the unborn child is a precious uh, human life uh, he or she is made loved by god they're deserving of our protection uh equal in human dignity with with children of other ages adults indeed um and in, in addition, as we've said for Christians, the value of the child in the womb from conception is 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 raised, is elevated, is seen in Jesus' incarnation, which begins at that very point. Um, Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't think it's um, possible to take any of these passages that we've looked at or even the whole scripture in, in total and, and try and change it. it. I feel like it takes a lot of work to do that in order to try and make it fit into the pro-abortion narrative. Um, and uh, as as the word of God says, if anyone changes or, or takes from this, um, then you know there's there is curse on on that person for doing that um so i think it's quite clear that any taking of innocent life in scripture is equated with murder um and those those passages just just go to show the the value of the human life so thank you for joining me tim um it's been great to to hear your insights, um, particularly on that pharmacaea. I just think that's fascinating to just hear more in general about the the ancient world. Uh, just have a window into what it would have uh, could have could have meant for them in that time. And it's so much more um, having that original language brings so much more depth to to the text than our, our word sorcery or witchcraft, where you just don't even think about that. So thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Beth. And, and I think, yeah, absolutely. But I think the one thing I would also finally want to emphasize to our listeners is the fact that we are, 
we are rapidly kind of moving to a point akin to the to the Greco-Roman world of the first century in terms of the kind of almost a pagan worldview. And so I think Christians are going to have to increasingly take their stands counterculturally on a huge range of issues. And, and so I would see this issue as certainly demonstrates it very starkly, but it's it's one of a number of things where as Christians we we kind of have a different, you know, we have a different script, we have a different uh set of set of guidelines and principles to to the surrounding increasingly pagan culture and we have to take a stand we can't just simply go with the tide because you know the the progressive tide is going back to a kind of pagan barbarity really i think on so many things and we have to say uh no to that as christians and why you know we have a coherent uh set of reasons uh why and uh, it's about choosing life uh, in all its fullness mm. Yeah, it is a it's an opportunity for us to be set apart to show that holiness and light uh, in an increasingly dark and hostile world. So I do think this is a challenge for Christians. If you're going to take scripture seriously, are you willing to stand up and be counted? This isn't something new. Uh, the church has been here in the past. And so we we don't have to try and find a new way in this. Um, but are we going to be counted amongst that cloud of witnesses who have gone before us? So thank you very much, Tim. My pleasure, Beth. Thank you for having me.